Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Anglo Turkish Society talk. I believe this is the last talk on our program um, before summer proper starts. So, in case anyone who um, doesn't know me, I'm Gemma. Um, I'm going to be chairing because our usual chair is off um, to sunnier climes in Munich. So, I am very, very happy to present tonight's speaker. Uh, BAFTA and Emmy award-winning television producer Joe Willett, who is now moving into historical biography, and we're very lucky, we're very happy to have her here talking about um, her first publication, her first of many, we hope, The Pioneering Life of Mary Wortley Montague, Scientist and Feminist. So, without much further ado, Joe, I give you the floor. That's lovely. Here is the book, by the way. Um, and if anybody would like to, to buy it, you can go on my website uh, and uh, contact me direct and I will sell it to you at a reduced rate of £20 rather than £25 if you, if you buy it in a bookshop. <laughs> um, so here's Lady Mary. She shines like a comet. She is all irregular and always wandering. She is the most wise, most imprudent, loveliest, disagreeablest, best-natured, cruelest woman in the world. This is what the young Joseph Spence said of her when he met her, uh, and when he was the tutor to Lord Lincoln, and he met her in Florence in 1741. She was 52 by then, he was in his 20s, and he was completely taken by her. Oh, yes, here we go. Mary was born in 1689. This is her father on the left, Evelyn Pierpont. Uh, so she was born, her parents were in London because it was the coronation of William and Mary. Um, they were both noble, they had an arranged marriage, and they knew it was important to be around for the coronation. Um, we don't know the date of her birth, we just know she was born around that kind of time. Um, her father did very, very well with networking and um, doing all the right thing, and he rose to become a duke, the Duke of Kingston, and even though he was from a noble family, he did incredibly well. Um, her mother was Mary Fielding, uh, spelled E-I, um, but she was related to uh, Fielding, the, the novelist, um, who said he was the only person in the family who knew how to spell because he, he spelled it F-I-E. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Mary, her mother, um, had, first of all, Lady Mary was the oldest child, then two other daughters, uh, Frances and Evelyn, and then a son, William, in very short succession. Um, and then she died of post-birth complications after William's birth. So Mary was only three when she lost her mother, and I always think that really, really affected her. Um, her father, who was under 30 at the time, was, was quite a drunk, quite a rake, not really at all interested in bringing up his children, sent them to live with his mother uh, in somewhere called West Dean in Wiltshire. Um, the house no longer exists, but uh, you can go and see the church there. And she was there until she was about 11 uh, with her grandmother. Uh, we don't think she got on particularly well with her grandmother. Um, and then the grandmother died, and the children were split up. Um, Evelyn, the youngest of the three daughters, uh, went to live with a very wealthy maiden aunt um, and she was given some money so that she, when she grew up, could have a good marriage. And the two older daughters and the son, William, went to Thorsby Hall, which was the main family home. And here you can see Thorsby. You can't visit Thorsby today. It burned down during Lady Mary's lifetime. But you can go to the area of Thorsby, and there's a 19th century uh, Thorsby Park is there, and it's a country house hotel town now. It's an interesting place to visit. Um, and <clears throat> um, William, the son, had a tutor there and very quickly went to Cambridge. But the two girls, they had governesses, but the whole aim of the governesses was to teach them to sew and to paint and really to make them good wives, and they did not want them to learn at all. But by chance, at Thorsby, uh, Lady Mary's uncle had built up one of the best libraries in Britain. I think probably hardly anybody had really read the books in that library. But those two girls went in and started reading. They used to have to pretend that they were reading romances, but in fact, they were teaching themselves Latin and Greek, um, Lady Mary found some Ovid, she was determined to read it herself. Uh, she found a Latin dictionary. Um, she was punished by her gover governesses for um, 
teaching herself. But uh, she said, but oh, my punishment exceeds my crime. And in fact, being somebody who, being a woman who was educated, was very, very important to her in life and really stood her in very good stead. And the two sisters began to write. Why are they like the Bronte sisters later in life? They would read um, the books and then they would uh, write their own version of the books, but from the female perspective, which I think is a brilliant way of learning how to, how to write creatively. Um, in the library was a book by a woman called Mary Estelle, who was quite an important person in Lady Mary's life, we'll come across her later on. And uh, Mary Estelle wrote a book advocating female education, um, but felt that it should be that women should be educated by themselves away from men. And Lady Mary was very taken with this idea. Um, because they're aristocratic, uh, women of this time expected to have arranged marriages. And so both Mary and Francis and their various friends went on to the marriage market, should we say, kind of late teens, early twenties. This is the person that Mary married on the left, Edward Workley Montague. She met him when she was 20 and he was 31. He was a barrister and an MP, and he was immediately taken by her intelligence as well as her looks. She became friendly with uh, Edward's younger sister, Anne, and so she and Anne would write to each other. And then we know, because we've actually got the, the, um, the manuscripts, that Edward was rewriting Anne's letters. So really they were coming from him, and Mary was pretty well aware of that. Um, but then Anne died, which of course was quite a big setback, and the two of them started writing to each other, which was quite a daring thing for Lady Mary to do. Both parents discovered it, although Mary's father didn't realise that she was writing to him. He would have been furious if he'd known that she was writing to him, what he wanted to do. And because both families were kind of aligned socially, maybe the working Montagues were quite as posh as the Pierponts, but you know, they were okay. So negotiations were opened for, um, for um, the two to marry. But working Montague, uh, Mary's husband-to-be, was quite stubborn, and he uh, was against something called entail, uh, where you had to promise, this traditionally you had to promise that um, if your wife inherited money, it would go straight to the children. What, in other words, you had no control of what happened to that money. And he felt that was wrong, and Mary's father was adamant that he, it was a very important part of marriage settlement. So um, uh, the, the negotiation stalled, and they didn't become engaged. Um, Mary and her friends, her girlfriends, divided men into three groups, heaven, hell, and limbo. <laughs> and to begin with, during the early days, um, Wortley Montague, Wortley had seemed like, like heaven to her. But I think she was a young girl, time passed. Um, there's an indication that she had a bit of a flirtation with somebody else. And so really he became limbo to her. He wasn't hell, but he was limbo. And her father then found somebody else that he wanted Mary to marry, an Irish peer with the fantastic name of Clotworthy Skeffington. And um, so, uh, but Lady Mary took one look at Clotworthy Skeffington and knew that for her, he would be hell. Um, and so that's a very difficult thing because her father was going to force her into marriage with Clotworthy Skeffington. So Wortley wrote to her and suggested that they should elope. Um, and obviously that was quite a tricky thing to do. It was a controversial thing to do, particularly with somebody that she knew she didn't love, although he loved her. Um, and we have, their letters at the time, they're both quite argumentative with each other, and you can tell that they're really not very well suited. He writes to her saying, I beg you will this once try to avoid being witty and write in a style of business. He was very much a businessman. His family had a mining business up in the northeast, and in fact, during their lifetime, he would put a lot of effort into that and become one of the wealthiest men in Britain. But Mary was never interested in business. Oh. She was interested in, in writing and in wit. But anyway, in August 1712, the two did elope, and he wrote to her saying, if we do elope, when we're in the carriage, let's not say a word to each other until we're in front of the parson in case we start arguing before we get there. 
But to begin with, the marriage seemed okay, and her sister wrote that Mary had proclaimed that she had found heaven. Uh, their early married life was spent in London, he had rooms in Covent Garden, and they settled there for a time. But money was quite tight, um, and um, because she had eloped, so her father cut her off at that point, um, and uh, she would only ever see her father once again in her entire life, apart from on his deathbed. Um, and her daughter wrote that uh, Mary was at her dressing table with her hair down in the middle of getting herself ready and a complete stranger came into the room and Mary fell at his feet because of course her daughter didn't realise that was Mary's father. That was the only time she ever met him again. Um, so the money was tight and they were a bit worried. They thought they shouldn't live in London and they, instead they rented this house which is Middlethorpe Hall. Today that's actually owned by the National Trust and it's a private, um, it's, a, it's a hotel. It's a wonderful hotel just outside York, worth visiting. Um, it, it literally looked pretty nice to us, but in fact it was a very good deal they got on it. Um, they got beer thrown in for a year and firewood thrown in for a year. And one of the reasons they rented it was because it's close to York, so if people came to see them, they wouldn't have to stay for dinner, which would be too expensive. They could just come for a cheaper meal earlier in the day. But Mary soon tired of Yorkshire. Um, uh, Workley was in London, he'd become an MP again, he got a, a seat back, and she really pressurised him to allow her to come to London. Um, and so, indeed she did, and she immediately fell in with a very close circle of friends who were really much more her type of people. On the left, you see the poet Alexander Pope. And he very quickly became a great, great friend of hers. Um, they both of them were outsiders. Uh, Pope, as you may well know, um, had had Pott's disease as a young man. So he was under five foot in height. Uh, and he was always in constant pain. He used to wear a corset all the time. So, and he could never do the kind of things that men did. He couldn't go to war. He couldn't travel. Uh, so he actually, it was more like being friends with a woman. Although I think obviously Pope, who was straight, didn't think that. Um, and in the middle, we've got John Gay, who wrote the opera, The Beggar's Opera. Um, Mary had met a lot of these people at um, the uh, Charles Jervis, the Irish portrait painter's studio, uh, where portraits were being painted, particularly of her, her husband's friend, uh, Joseph Addison. And, she, and Pope, when he was in London, would, would stay with uh, Charles Jervis. And the three of them, or well, all of this circle, including, including Congreve, the playwright as well, they began to write, they began to share their works with each other. Um, and Mary and Pope and Gay wrote a series of letters which they based on, a, a series of poems which they based on Virgil's pastoral eclogues, where you wrote, he, Virgil wrote a poem, but his were pastoral, a poem for each day of the week. Um, but they wrote the town eclogues, where they really satirised London life. Um, and again, we, we kind of have a sense of which ones, it, they're presented as one, but you have a sense of which ones were Mary's, and which ones were, um, were Pope's, and which ones were gay, gay's. And um, there's a wonderful little description of she and Pope writing together, and her saying, no Pope, no touching, but then whatever is good for anything will pass for yours, and the rest for mine. And I always think that's kind of very telling of the relationship, really. Um, in one of Mary's poems, she, uh, she um, satirized two women who were very, very keen to be ladies of waiting, in waiting at the court um, of the Princess of Wales, Caroline Mansbach. Um, now, these poems, in fact, most of aristocratic writing at the time was not published. Um, they were just passed among friends, and unfortunately, those letters were circulated. That those poems were circulated, and Caroline Vansbach read them. But then, worse than that, Edmund Curl, who was a very scurrilous publisher, uh, published them without their consent. Uh, and obviously, that wasn't great for Mary because it wasn't great to be seen to be uh, against the Princess of Wales. But then something important happened to Mary in uh, 1716. Uh, On the right of the picture, she caught smallpox. We have to remember that at the time, one in 10 people in Europe died from smallpox. 
box. It was very, very, very little. I always include this picture so you can see what it was like uh, to have it. Uh, Mary's only brother, William, who we talked about earlier, had died of it in December 1715. By the way, age 19, Matt already married off in an arranged marriage with two small children. Extraordinary life. Um, and Mary was absolutely gutted when he died. Um, and when she, she knew that she had contracted smallpox because he got a very, very high temperature, uh, Wortley was away dealing with his mines in the north. And so she, by this time they had a son who had been born with him in Yorkshire, their only son, Edward. She sent Edward away. She locked herself up in their house in London. Um, straw was put down on the cobbles outside uh, to deaden the horse's hooves. And it, the press said that they, uh, they thought she wouldn't survive. In fact, she did survive. Um, but to describe to you this, what it was like to have smallpox, first of all, you would get a, a terrible rash with spots that would start in your fingers and in your toes and spread towards your trunk. You would have thousands of spots. And after a time, those spots then became sores, swollen, red and yellow, and they emitted foul-smelling pus, which is very important for our story. Um, uh, and you couldn't speak because you had uh, these sores in your mouth as well, and you were salivating a lot. Um, then, if you survived that bit of it, on the fifth day, those sores then became pustules, like having dried peas under your skin. If you got to that stage, it meant you probably would survive. But then those pustules turned to scabs, and the scabs left the scarring that you can see down below. And of course, we, we all know about smallpox scarring. Um, for Mary, who had the Christopher aristocratic life, had been at court, that was obviously a problem. She, this, she couldn't be a courtier anymore because she'd lost her looks. She talked about Samuel Garth, the doctor, visiting her and saying to her, you shall again be well, again be fair. And she wrote in one of the town eclogues about smallpox, which she wrote after the time, she wrote, false was his oath, my beauty is no more. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, while uh, Mary, and the other thing to say is that Mary probably, while she had smallpox, was lying, uh, being treated by this doctor. There was no treatment. Uh, there were two rival uh, ways of dealing with smallpox at the time. Either they kept you very, very hot or they kept you very, very cold, but neither of it. Really, neither really made any difference. But she would have heard the doctors coming in and out talking about her, and um, they, the, 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 the um, physicians who saw her, Samuel Garth and Hans Slow and various other people, they were members of the Royal Society. And word had reached the Royal Society by this time that in Turkey people did have a means of protecting themselves against smallpox. So Mary may well have heard that. As a woman, she couldn't be a member of the Royal Society, so she couldn't actually go along to hear that herself. Um, while she was lying ill, the town eclogues were published, uh, to, and obviously to great scandal, and Workley returned from the North and was reputedly very distraught, both about the publication and about the fact that obviously his wife had lost her looks. The other thing to say is that um, there were side effects, other side effects from smallpox, and Mary's eyesight was always quite bad after that. She found it very difficult to read um, at night, and she lost her eyelashes and eyebrows. So um, all her friends said that she had the workly stare from then on. Um, uh, workly had a job working in the Treasury, but it wasn't going particularly well. There was an upstart politician called Robert Walpole, um, a rather similar to Boris Johnson, I always think, and he uh, didn't like Workley very much. So when Workley was offered the role of British ambassador, Her Majesty's Britannic ambassador to the Turkish Ottoman Empire on the 7th of April, 1716, for both of them, this was a way out of their troubles. And Workley accepted it. Uh, which meant that the two of them, with their young son, traveled out across Europe in, in a coach all the way to Turkey. Um, Turkey at the time 
was at war with Venice. They'd been at war since 1714. And the British feared that the Austrians were going to enter on Venice's side, which in fact they did, even before the Wadi Montagues arrived in Turkey. And they left, two of them left, on the 1st of August, 1716. Mary's sporting a black wig, I think probably because she needed that to kind of make herself feel a bit better. And she tended to wear a riding habit on the way out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Joseph Spencer, we talked about earlier, wrote that what she said to him of it was, "'Twas a sort of dying to her friends and country, but t'was travelling, t'was going further than most other people go, t'was wandering, t'was all whimsical and charming, and so she set out with all the pleasure imaginable. Mary always loved travelling. It has to be said that normally the ambassador, ambassador was men, they would always go by themselves. So it was very unusual for her to want to go with it and with him. And of course it was dangerous. Normally you would keep your post for about five years. So she was going to be away for a long time and she probably was unlikely to return. Pope, before she left, visited her and gave her a copy of the town eclogues bound in red, red leather. Um, and he was very, very sad that she was going. Um, and wrote, I'm sorry, I just need to find, here we go, wrote of her, Indeed, I find I begin to behave myself worse to you than to any other woman, as I value you more. Uh, and of course, he didn't know that he would necessarily ever see her again. So, as I say, they travelled across Europe for several months. They stopped in Hanover, they stopped in Rotterdam before that. They went to Vienna, and then they had to double back to Hanover to take letters. They drove across the battlefield of Petrovardin, where uh, Prince Eugene of the Austrians had defeated the Turks, because the, the, by now the Austrians were on the Venetians, uh, Venetian side against Turkey. And Mary did write back to Pope, um, describing her horror at seeing a battlefield with all these bodies lay, laying on it. Um, so she wrote a series of letters throughout this time, throughout her whole trip. Um, and we now know these as the embassy letters. She kept a copy of all the letters that she wrote, or most of the letters she wrote. And then when she came back to London uh, a few years later, uh, Mary Stell, who was the person she'd read about in the library and who advocated female-only uh, education, was by now a friend of hers. They're very different. Mary Stell was a much less wealthy than Lady Mary and, uh, and never married, didn't really trust men, and thought that Lady Mary was rather flirty. But they became great friends. And Mary Stell persuaded Lady Mary that they should edit the, what we now call the embassy letters, put them together in a volume. Um, and again, because Mary was scarred from the whole thing of the, the, uh, the um, town act was having been published, they would just be circulated among their friends. And then the idea was that when Lady Mary died, the letters would be published. And Mary Stell wrote a very, very fulsome uh, prologue saying that she viewed Lady Mary as, as her successor. So back to the travelling. Um, so, so by the way, here on the left, that's the frontispiece of the letters. And these letters are very, very important. They're fascinating. I would really encourage you to read them now. They, they, they're a really interesting read. Um, on their travels, well, after the Battle of Petrograd in, in early 1717, the working Montagues were stopped before they could enter Turkey, and they were billeted in Belgrade with a Turkish oh, not a Turkish, but an Islamic um, thinker and writer called Ahmed Beg, who Lady Mary wrote in a way he was a, a sort of almost like a count. And she, she and Ahmed Beg immediately formed a great friendship. They spoke to each other in Italian. They ate together every evening um, with kind of small plates and sort of, you know, the kind of food that we think of, of now, I think, when we, when we go to when I as a visitor go to Turkey, they discussed the Quran. She noticed that he drank in moderation, and he said that, that the rules against drinking were only for common people. Um, he said to her that women went to a separate heaven, and she loved that idea. It must have reminded her a bit of Mary Stell, I think. And the two of them talked a lot about the condition of women at the time. He obviously would have had a harem in his home, but she completely ignored that. Um, but he did talk to her about the whole idea of Islamic dress for women. And he said to her, we have the advantage that when our wives cheat us, nobody knows it. She was encouraged by him 
after they left, um, to when they were travelled on to Sofia, I think because she talked to him, she decided by herself to visit a hammam. And on the top right here, you can see Anne, the French um, artist. This, this was painted 100 years after Lady Mary, but it's a famous picture in the Louvre. And it was inspired by her trip to a Turkish bath. Um, and uh, male travellers at the time hadn't been able to enter Turkish baths, so it was very particular that Mary did. Or one did, but he says that the women all cover their distinguishing parts. Whereas Mary was able to see them like this. What she was struck by immediately was that none of them had smallpox scars. And also they didn't have the red marks of laced underwear that Western women uh, did. Um, she immediately felt that they treated her as an equal. She said there was not the least wanton smile or a modest gesture among them. She was very struck by their physical beauty and the way that the women, the aristocratic women sat at the front and the slaves behind did their hair. And she joked that her friend Charles Jervis, the um, portrait painter, she said he would definitely have painted better if he could have seen these women. And she loved the way they were talking amongst themselves. Four or five hours they'd stay at the hammam talking, just as people do today. And she thought, reminded, it reminded her of a London coffee house, where, of course, in the 18th century in London, men, not women, were meeting and talking about the politics of the day. Mary was always very interested in politics, and she would have felt sad that she couldn't have gone to a London coffee house. So that really struck her. It's very hot in the Turkish bath. And um, the women gestured to her to say, why don't she take off her riding habit? And eventually she had to open it up and show them the whalebone stays underneath. And she said that she felt that they were thinking, well, which of us is the prisoner here? We or you? Um, they then traveled on and arrived at Adrianople, uh, which is modern day a DNA where Sultan Ahmed III was there with his army, and they arrived in the spring of 1718. Mary was really struck by the beauty of the whole world she was entering here. She loved the gardens, she loved the fruit trees, she loved the camels, she loved the mosques. The French ambassador and his wife were about the same age as them, and they struck up great friendship. Um, and Mary was very, very keen to go exploring but the French ambassadress was much less uh, ambitious and much less adventurous than Lady Mary, and her, and her husband was much more protective of her. The, the, the two couples settled into their new homes, and Mary describes them being made of wood with separate living quarters for the men and the women, joined by a passage. And she loved the way that there was no furniture. The rooms had built-in platforms covered with carpet. She ordered herself a Turkish costume, and she would go exploring at this time. If any of you have ever read the Virginia Woolf novel, Orlando, that is inspired by Lady Mary's traveling in her Turkish costume. And in the bottom right here, you can see the artist Jean-Baptiste Van Moore, who was living in Constantinople at the time. I think this was actually painted in Constantinople. Um, and he painted her portrait. You will see with the portraits after this, very, very rarely any smallpox scarring, I think, out of uh, politeness to her. But you can see her with her young son. I think it's an absolute wonderful picture. That's in the uh, National Portrait Gallery if you want to go look at it. After a time, the court moved on to Constantinople. And the Whitney Montagues moved into the British Embassy, uh, which was in peril. Today, the site of that is where the British Consul is. Uh, but that uh, building was burnt down. At the time, it was a resplendent 17th century palace, um, and it, it included a life-size model of the Chapel Royal Windsor, which seems incredible to me. She loved life there. She loved the way that it was very multicultural there. She said, my grooms are Arabs, my footmen, French, English, and Germans, my nurse, an Armenian, and we'll come to this nurse in a moment, my housemaids, Russians, half a dozen other servants, Greeks, my steward, an Italian, my janissaries, Turks. Um, she loved the life there. And she described being in Para and looking across the Golden Horn, which I bet is a view that many of you have looked at. And certainly I did when I went to, to research this. 
uh, and she said that it, looking across the Golden Horn to the palaces and mosques reminded her of a wooden cabinet with China ornaments displayed on the shelves. And I think, actually, if you look at that view, I can see why she thought that. Um, on the right of this picture, you see Sultan Ahmed's pavilion, which is still there today. That's a photograph I took. Workley would have had um, uh, meetings with Sultan Ahmed there. Mary was obviously not, not allowed to do that, but she was criticized by British politicians uh, both in Vienna and back in London for being much too influential on her husband and having views on things and people thinking that she was rather taken by someone looking rather good looking and that had influenced things. She became pregnant during this time for her second child, her daughter, and there's a wonderful poem she wrote, Verses Written in the Kiosk of the British Palace, where she wrote about the beautiful uh, Turkey compared with cold old England, heavily pregnant, sitting with her feet kept warm in a tendor, which she absolutely loved, with the warmth of the fire covered by a Turkish carpet. Um, uh, Workley would be following, obviously, the court, so he was away because then Ahmed III went back to Adrianople and then travelled and uh, Workley went with her. So Mary was often by herself uh, with her children. They arranged to have Dr. Timoni, who was an Italian physician, to be there, I think, presumably, we don't know, but probably for the birth of, of her daughter, Mary, also called Mary, can be um, uh, And um, Mary was very, very taken during this time and wrote a lot about the condition of women, the way that women were living their lives. This was always a theme she loved. She was the first European woman to be invited to dine with the wives of Turkish dignitaries. Uh, and she learned Turkish during her time and was very proud of the fact that she could speak in Turkish to them. She particularly connected to Fatima, who was the wife of Sultan Ahmed III, steward. And when she went to Fatima's house, she saw a display of belly dancing, and they talked about the paradox of Eastern clothing giving women greater freedom uh, than Western women. Uh, and she was very, very impressed by the way that Turkish men looked after their wives. She wrote, they are the only women in the world that lead a life of un uninterrupted pleasure. I think already her own marriage was showing some strain, and she probably could, felt that very strongly because of that. But she did also recognize the pressure on women in this culture to produce women, choose women, to produce children, and the shame of dying childless. And she contrasted that with the a veneration the Catholics had at the time of the Virgin Mary. When she drove across Europe, she'd been to a lot of Catholic churches. She'd been very, very struck by all the worshiping of the Virgin Mary. So again, that feature is clear. She also writes at some point of coming across a naked, blood-stained female corpse lying in the street, wrapped in a sheet with two knife wounds, and how all the men of Pera came to look at the corpse. And she was very aware, she wrote home, that that woman would never see justice. See justice. So her letters are a fascinating uh, account of, of life at the time. But of course, the most fascinating thing for us all is the fact that she came across inoculation against the smallpox, which is what the Turks were doing. And on the left here, you'll see an artist's impression uh, of of what was used in inoculation. When I went to uh, Istanbul, I tried my hardest to find out, to find anything about inoculation there in the Science Museum there. I could find nothing. Uh, and I'm very interested to hear if any of you do know, I believe, of just been learning this evening, there's more at a DNA, which would be very, very interesting. But let me just read you a little bit from the book about, about what the Turks did to protect themselves. Every autumn, once the soaring summer, temp summer temperatures had abated, groups of 15 or 20 people got to bed together to be engrafted. For several weeks, they isolated themselves from their friends and families. The predominantly Muslim Turks employed a Christian woman, usually a Greek or Armenian, often elderly and almost certainly illiterate, to carry out the process. She was required to find someone nearby who was suffering from smallpox and to visit their sick bed. She extracted a small amount of smallpox matter, in other words, the pus that I was telling you about earlier, from their sores, 
and transfer a portion of this liquid into a clean, a, a transfer this liquid into a clean glass vessel. She quickly transported this back to the waiting group of Turks, storing it in her armpit or bosom to keep it warm. Next, she used a three-edged surgeon's needle to open up some small wounds, normally on the arms or legs, of each of the people gathered together. Um, although she was treating Muslims, sometimes out of Christian superstition, the woman would make cuts on the people's foreheads as well as the cuts on their heads, heads arms and legs, making the shape of a cru crucifix. She carefully transferred the pus she collected from the glass vessel into walnut shells, one for each patient. Using her 3 h needle again, she introduced a tiny amount of the liquid from the nutshell into each person's bleeding wounds on their wrists and ankles. She strapped the nutshell to the small cuts so as to use every last drop of the precious smallpox matter. The group of Turks would then wait patiently for several days. Typically, on about the eighth day, they all started to run a fever and would be put to bed. A few red and yellow spots appeared on the patient's bodies. Had they contracted smallpox naturally, the number would have been far greater. So, it's natural smallpox, you'd have had about 3,000, 4,000 spots. Here you might have 10, 15 spots. A week or so later, they would be well enough to go on their separate ways, protected from smallpox for the rest of their lives. The work they wanted to use had brought with them a surgeon. Now, in those days, a surgeon was not as eminent as a physician called Mr. Mont uh, Mr. Maitland, sorry, a Scottish surgeon, Mr. Maitland. He travelled out with them because he'd heard about inoculation too. So he was there when Mary decided to try out inoculation on their only son, Edward in April 1718. She made sure that Workley was away at the time, uh, and Dr. P T Timoni, he'd probably been there for the birth of her daughter, helped her. The, the um, chaplain ahead of time, Dr. Mr. Cross, wrote saying he thought it was against God and she shouldn't do it, but she went ahead and had Edward inoculated, and sure enough, it absolutely went fine. Um, but this isn't the really historic thing that, that Mary did. Uh, because the previous British ambassador, Sir Robert Sutton, had had his two sons inoculated as well. Um, Mary didn't have her daughter, her baby daughter, inoculated, and that was because the Armenian nurse of her younger daughter, of her daughter, who I mentioned earlier, had not been inoculated, had not been inoculated against smallpox, and Mary didn't want to run the risk of. She knew she'd already worked out that if she inoculated her baby daughter then her baby daughter would be infectious until the spots came. And she didn't want to endanger the life of the Armenian nurse. And in fact, the Armenian nurse traveled back with the family to England and did live with the family for several years. Um, Mary wrote to her childhood friend, Sarah Chiswell, outlining all of this. Uh, and she said that, uh, if I live to return, I will perhaps have the courage to war with doctors back in England and to introduce inoculation as an idea. And indeed, Wortley was recalled relatively early and the family travelled back. Uh, he was just slightly politically outmaneuvered. So they travelled back earlier than they thought. Mary arrived back in 1718. In 1719, there was another outbreak of smallpox because there were more and more outbreaks of smallpox at the time. And people, as we all know now, because we've had control of this, had to stay in their houses and protect themselves. But Mary didn't try inoculation against her daughter then. But in April, in, in the spring of 1721, there was another terrible outbreak of smallpox. And Mr. Maitland, who by now was uh, practicing as a surgeon in Hertfordshire, wrote, it seemed to go forth, smallpox seemed to go forth like a destroying angel. Uh, Mary lost a young cousin of hers and she lost a great friend of hers. And she resolved to be brave enough to try inoculation on her daughter, a little girl, who by now was three. So she summoned Mr. Maitland. He was pretty unenthusiastic about it. He tried to put it all, her off. He said the weather's different from Turkey, but she said it doesn't matter. They kind of waited for seven days, and eventually he said that he would be okay to go ahead with it. He had wanted it to be witnessed by physicians at the time, but Mary was adamant that she wanted to just do it by themselves. And she said only when uh, young Mary had spots would they introduce 
um, physicians and uh, several ladies and other persons of distinction, probably uh, society friends of Lady Mary's. So they inoculated young Mary, it all went very well, uh, and the three physicians who visited, one, uh, um, Dr. Keith, had lost his older two sons to smallpox, so he had a little boy called Peter Keith, and he asked if Peter could be inoculated as well, and Mary agreed, so they inoculated Peter. But because he was the son of a physician, uh, they bled him and they purged him, first of all, because that's what you tended to do. Now, Mary knew, because they didn't do it in Turkey, that he didn't need to do that, but she felt she had to out of uh, respect for him, and Peter Keith was fine. Um, and word reached Princess Caroline of Ansbach here on the left that, uh, uh, that inoculation had come to Britain. We can't prove that it was Lady Mary's experiment of inoculation that uh, Princess Caroline heard about, but I think it's pretty likely it was. And Caroline of Ansbach took it up as a cause. Her uh, older daughter had already had smallpox. Um, previous members of the British royal family had died from smallpox, including Queen Mary of William and Mary. And she knew that if she could protect her children, that was a very, very important thing. Uh, so she took up the cause, um, and there was something called the Newgate Experiment, where six prisoners in Newgate Jail who were condemned to death were offered the chance to be inoculated against smallpox, and if they survived, they would be set free. They agreed. Five of them were fine. One of them didn't contract inoculated smallpox because he'd already had smallpox, so unfortunately he was condemned to death. But the other five did very well. People also questioned whether you would have ongoing immunity. And so they did another experiment where they sent one of these Newgate prisoners who had had inoculated smallpox and recovered, sent them to lie with a smallpox patient in Mr. Nathan's surgery to prove that he was totally protected from smallpox. And this went well. And a year later, uh, Caroline Ansbach had her two daughters vaccinated. Mr. Maitland wrote the only, uh, the, the, the first surviving account of the inoculation against the smallpox. Um, and Sir Hans Sloan, the uh, royal physician, took up the cause, but he was very nervous of it. He didn't want to have his own grandchildren uh, inoculated. But Caroline Mansbach was pressurising to have the heir to the throne, Prince Frederick Louis, who was in Hanover, because the English royal family at the time were really German and they were partly in Hanover. She wanted to have him inoculated. So Mr. Maitland and Hanslow went over to um, Hanover and they inoculated Prince Frederick Louis. Hanslow, because he was nervous, checked with George I, first of all, Prince Frederick Louis' grandfather, to see if he thought it was going to be okay. And George I said, well, what are the odds of him dying? And he was told one in a thousand. And he said, oh, those are good odds. I'll take that. Which I think is very, very telling for us today when we worry about, about vaccination. So you would have thought that Mary would have been celebrated for bringing inoculation from Turkey to Britain. In fact, she wrote later that there wasn't a day in her life went back by when she didn't regret it. And she said, what an arduous, what a fearful, and we may add, what a thankless enterprise it was. Um, Hans Sloan, the royal physician, wrote an account of it, but he credited Workley. He was nowhere around at the time for either of her experiments. He didn't mention what happened to Twickenham at all. The whole thing became very, very politicized. People were very anti-Turkish. They wrote lots of anti-Turkish stuff about it. There was lots of anti-German stuff because the royal family were German. And someone called William Wagstaff, who was also very sexist, wrote that a few ignorant women upon slender experience had introduced this folk practice. Mary and her daughter used to travel um, the south, southern counties in their coach at the invitation of aristocratic households, and they would go and inoculate everybody in the household. But her daughter wrote about people jeering their carriage as they went by, and uh, about the significant shrugs of servants as they arrived, thinking this was really a very dodgy thing to be doing, and looks of dislike. Um, and uh, Mary couldn't stop the fact that doctors wanted to medicalize the process. So increasingly, people were bled and purged 
and then they began to put them on special diets before they were inoculated. So sometimes people did die, and it may well have been because of the bleeding and the purging beforehand. Uh, there was also lots written about how the wounds were too big, the gashes were too big, and this was a reason that people died. Um, I think, actually, a large amount of it was that the, in Britain they didn't realise that they needed to s isolate people between the inoculation, between the, the engrafting, the inoculation, and when they got their spots. They didn't get that, which of course we now understand about self-isolating. In fact, uh, 30 years later, Hans Sloan did revise his account and did um, accept that uh, it was Lady Mary and not really Wortley who had done it. Um, Mary by then was far away, uh, but she was, she did have some kind of celebration in the sort of like, final 20 years of her life. But what people talked about with her was that she had kept women beautiful, not that she had kept people safe. They didn't view her as a scientist. Um, and her friend Pope, by this time, had fallen out with her very, very badly. Uh, we don't exactly know why, but his feelings for her were quite uncontrolled, even when he was writing to her when she was abroad. Today we read those letters and they seem quite kind of predator-like. Um, she managed to kind of control things for about 10 years, but then they fell out very, very badly. And in his writing against her, because he was very powerful, he was a published author, so he was a very powerful enemy. And one of the, I think, the most heinous things he did was he wrote about her saying that she was poxed, that she would be poxed by her love or libeled by her hate. Very cleverly there, he was eliding smallpox and venereal disease. Uh, so he knew that people knew, knew of her as the woman who had brought a cure for smallpox. She didn't have an aerial disease, but he was implying that she did. So we now know about vaccination. It's important just to explain quickly about inoculation and vaccination. So on the left here, we have Edward Jenner, um, who really pioneered vaccination. So in the second half of the 18th century, uh, after Lady Mary, smallpox, inoculation against the smallpox in Britain became pretty accepted. There was a, uh, the first smallpox hospital set up not very far from here in 1745. Um, and a man called Daniel Sutton commercialized the idea of inoculating people and put them on a special diet beforehand. Uh, um, but as I say, it wasn't totally successful and uh, actually a Dorset farmer in the 1760s did an experiment himself which we would view as vaccination. Everybody knew that milkmaids didn't suffer from smallpox and you might have heard of the, uh, the, the nursery rhyme, my face is my fortune sir she said, which was about a dairy maid. And the reason that dairy maids didn't get poxed by smallpox, didn't get smallpox, was because they, the cows had a disease called cowpox. And they got this from milking the cows, from the udder of the cows. This was kind of folklore at the time. And Benjamin Jesty, who was a, a Dorset farm, dairy farm in the 1760s, realized this. And rather than inoculating his wife and daughters, he introduced a little bit of cowpox to the wounds. And sure enough, it worked. Um, but Edward Jenner, who was a scientist, he was a member of the Royal Society later in the century, in 1798, so a full 80 years after Lady Mary, himself experimented, a more scientific experiment with cowpox, with his servant, and discovered that it worked, that cowpox was a, you could introduce cowpox to people and it was a slightly safer way of making sure that um, they were protected against smallpox. A very good thing with it was that you didn't have to self-isolate. As soon as you had cowpox introduced, you were safe. You see on the right, he also had some trouble with it. Um, that's by Gilray, and people thought how extraordinary. And they did really have cows walking around, and people used to be, have a little bit of cowpox introduced to them. Um, but the whole reason Edward Jenner came to this was that as a teenager, he had been inoculated using the Lady Mary treatment. 
and he had been bled and purged. He was very sensitive as a young boy, and he hated the experience, and he thought there must be a better way of doing this. Now, we tend to think that as soon as vaccination came in, inoculation stopped, but in fact, that's not right. They exist, coexisted for about 40 years um, until finally uh, inoculation was banned. And they were pretty similar in that it was done hand to hand. Vaccination at the time wasn't done with a needle like we think of it. Um, and one advantage of inoculation was that when you were inoculated, you were protected for the rest of your life, whereas with vaccination, you weren't. Um, and the reason, obviously, that we call it vaccination is from the Latin for cows, vacca. Uh, and the reason that now it isn't just, we don't just refer to vaccination against the smallpox, we use it obviously with COVID, we use it for many, many um, diseases, is that in the 19th century, Pasteur was doing experiments on typhoid against chickens. And he used the same process of introducing a tiny bit of the disease, and he realized that would cure. And so he said, in honor of this, I think we should call it vaccination. But of course, he actually could have called it inoculation, because you can trace the relationship. And if he had, Lady Mary might have been better known today. We don't have much time, because I've talked I've talk to you quite a lot. Um, but. Um, into, just to also finish off by talking about the rest of Lady Mary's life. She lived in London and Twick Twickenham and London for 20 years. And then in 1736, she, at the age of 47, fell in love with a 24 year old uh, Italian, Francesca Algarotti. By that time, Pope was making life very difficult for her. Her marriage was very stale. She had a son and a daughter, and the relationship with both of them was difficult. And so she went off to live in Venice with Algarotti. In fact, the relationship didn't really work out very well. She didn't realize he was bisexual. Um, but she, when the relationship came to an end, she decided to continue living uh, in, in uh, Europe. And she stayed there for 23 years in Central Europe. A lot of war was going on at the time. It was a pretty brave thing to do. And she only returned to London when uh, Workley, her husband, died. So for that time, 23 years, she never saw Workley again. In fact, she obviously didn't, didn't see her daughter either because her daughter was back in England. Um, in 1761, Workley died. And his will was very, very controversial because they had, as I say, one son and one daughter, and he left everything to the daughter uh, because the son had been a terrible, terrible worry to them. Um, and so Mary, even though she had breast cancer at this point, she knew she was dying, she bravely travelled back across Europe to London because the son was contesting the will. And she wanted to make it clear that she absolutely supported her husband and what she, what she was doing. And on the way, knowing she was dying, she stayed in Rotterdam overnight. And she met uh, um, the Reverend Benjamin Sowden. Um, and She'd never met him before. He was a vicar, but she trusted him, and she gave him her embassy letters, telling all about her, her travels and all the about the time in Turkey, and said, please make sure these are published. And so then she died in the August of 1762, and the Reverend Sowden gave the letters to Mary's daughter and to her son-in-law, the Earl of Butte, who by now was Prime Minister. Um, and they really were quite embarrassed by Lady Mary. She'd been a bit awkward. She'd arrived back with lots of Venetian fashions, and they had, when she died, they had a buried quite quickly. So they said to Benjamin Sound, thank you very much, um, and then they destroyed the letters. But by total luck, Benjamin Sound had loaned the letters to two travellers when he was in Rotterdam. They copied the letters overnight, and then without telling anybody, they got those letters published. So it was, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be reading those today. And in fact, Lady Mary's daughter, Lady Mary kept a journal her entire life. And Lady Mary's daughter was the only person ever to read that journal. Uh, and she, apart, oh, she allowed her own daughter to read a bit of it. But she, again, thought it was too scurrilous and destroyed it. And I always think if that journal had survived, we would think of Lady Mary as a peeps today. It would have been given us the most fascinating insight into life in the 18th century from a woman's point of view. Um, so I wish she was better known, and I will just finish here with, with a, a, a town in Italy 
where Lady Mary did live for a short period and where they really do um, celebrate her. Everywhere you go, there's the Lady Mary working onto you Esplanade because she happened to write in her letters that it was one of the prettiest places she'd ever been and they liked to market her. But I feel we should think of her as the equivalent of a Mary Shelley or a Virginia Woolf as somebody that we remember for many, many reasons, but not least because of her time in Turkey. Masses is to take in. No. Hope you all enjoyed it. That was a lot of information, very informative. I've got some rather comprehensive notes. Um, and thank you for someone who's kind of most familiar with Lady Mary's Turkish period. It was actually quite lovely to see her. The sort of the whole story, as it were. So, um, people joining us on Zoom, if you have any questions for Joe, please feel free to drop them in the chat. But um, if not, I will uh, kick off the uh, discussion. Can I ask you, can you tell us anything more about Lady Mary's children? Uh, well, I'm, yes, I talked a little bit about it, obviously. Yes, yes. So, they were, she had two children, they were very different from each other. The daughter, as I said, was very kind of conventional. Um, she and Mary were quite close when younger Mary was young, um, but um, younger Mary fell, fell in love with this man John Stuart Earl of Butte, and her parents, rather similarly, didn't think much of the, didn't think the marriage was, was a good one. They didn't think it was good <laughs> enough for their daughter. So they allowed her to go ahead because they felt they couldn't stop it like their own parents had done. Um, but there were like, no flowers and it was treated as a very kind of, you know, not a great marriage. Um, and uh, before she went travelling to Italy, Lady Mary fell out with her daughter. We don't exactly know why, but we believe that Lady Mary felt that her daughter didn't love her. Partly, I suspect, because Lady Mary had told them what she thought of Butte. She thought that he was um, a bit prosy, he was, a, he was an actor, he liked acting, and um, she thought that he just talked too much. So, for 23 years, Gradually, gradually, the relationships got better by letters. The Beatles had a huge family, and they eventually did come to London, rather similar again to the Wetley Montagues. They thought they couldn't afford London, first of all, but then they did come, and Butte um, became the tutor to the young George III. And then, when George III became king, he made Butte his first prime minister. So they were very, very established, which I think is why they, they found her a bit embarrassing. But the son, a very, very different story, and a very sad story, really. He obviously had been with them in Turkey as a, as a child, came back. He was sent to Westminster, which at the time had huge amounts of bullying. He ran away from Westminster. First of all, he ran to Oxford, but then he was recovered. But then he ran away again to sea. And he was a cabin boy on a boat, which went all the way to Gibraltar. And he was missing for several months. They thought he died. Um, so the, he was recovered, but then they didn't quite know what to do with him. They couldn't handle him. They sent him abroad with kind of tutors, and of course he started drinking. He went through a very religious phase. He started drinking. He spent money like water. He then came back and married a washerwoman, which obviously was a huge disgrace. Older than him, didn't live with her. Um, Lady Mary, when she was in Avignon in South of France, did meet him once again and tried to, to sort things out, but it was very difficult. He then had a bigamous marriage with another woman, and he ended up in uh, the Châtelet prison in Paris, and his father arranged for him to come, become a, an MP so he wouldn't, he would escape prosecution in, in Britain. I mean, that sounds like a fascinating life story in and of itself. Well, yes. it is, it um, is, it just, is. And of course you mentioned the very sad thing. Uh, um, what, uh, the son? Yes. No, no, he lived a certain age. In fact, he always loved Turkey. There are pictures of him wearing a, uh, a turban, and um, he uh, actually had a, I mean, another relationship, and it seemed that Mary had an Islamic grandson, um, but probably an inherited one. I mean, uh, um, an adopted one, but still interesting for us now, multiculturally. No, he lived, and he disputed the will, um, I mean, I didn't have the happiest of lives, but that's why their father, who was very straight, didn't want to leave his money to, to him. Fair enough. Mm. Mm. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Do you? Well, it's clear from what you said that Mary is an exceptional woman. What do you think, from her childhood, 
contributed towards that. I think, I, as I said, I think the mother dying so young made yeah. her very, very independent mm -hmm. and very, very strong. I definitely think educating herself was a major, major thing. But I think she did have a problem, we would now say, with intimacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was probably because her mother did die very young, and her father was quite unloving, really, towards her. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and obviously she was fearsomely intelligent, and she had the space to be able to really develop that, which again is a very, very interesting thing at the time. When you were speaking about her and her sister, um educating themselves, it just almost struck me that she seemed to be that personality type. The more you said, you know, don't touch that or don't do that, the more she was, well, I'm going to do it. Totally, totally. Um, and, and, yes. and I really just love that about her. She feels to be so much like a person of today. She mm. really does. I mean, if we met today, we absolutely know that kind of person. I would, I would follow her on Instagram, for yes. sure. Yes. <laughs> Hashtag role model. Well, I always think she'd be very good on Twitter. Oh, she was. Very, very witty. Very good. <laughs> Can I just offer a question about your, your publication, your book? So, as you said, this is the book, The Pioneering Life of Mary Wortley Montague, Scientist and a Feminist, which you can get at reduced rate by contacting Jo through her website. And if you ask her nicely, she might sign it before she sends it to you, but no promises. Of course. I, I yeah. would like to ask you about the, uh, the subtitle, Scientist and a um, Feminist. I think those are two fantastic things that now we know um, go together as sort of um, women in academia, you know, women in STEM are, are, are a very fantastic cause. So how did that um, <coughs> subtitle sort of occur to you, or how did that sort of come about? Well, I should say that neither word, scientist or feminist, was around in the 18th century when Mary lived. Um, so first of all, when I started looking into Lady Mary, I wanted to write about her writing, because I loved her writing, and she is an early feminist, and she works with very few things about women. When I approached publishers, they said, oh, you know, I mean, that's, well, firstly, they said, um, you, I, I, my, my first title was The Georgian Feminist. They said, oh, no one's interested in the Georgians. No, if only it was Victorian. And then they said, no, you, 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 no one's interested in, in feminists. You won't get a book published. So I was then trying to find a hook, and remember, this was pre-COVID, and I thought, well, she did do that inoculation in the spring of 1721. The book's going to be published in the spring of 2021. So I'll tie that together and say it's the 300th anniversary of the inoculation. Mm -hmm. I wrote the book before COVID even existed, delivered it on the 1st of March of 2020, and of course then we all had COVID. So when I was writing it, when they talked about people staying in their homes in Twitter and never going anywhere, I thought, how extraordinary never realising that this was going to become such a big thing. History repeats itself. It's amazing. And then by the time it was published, of course, in Britain, we did have vaccination. So again, it seemed all the more relevant. And I think it's very, again, a very unsung thing that this came from Turkey. If we hadn't had that, we wouldn't have had vaccination. Personally, I think it's been very untimely to have this discussion, not only about the work of a woman scientist, but also about the importance of you know, inoculation and vaccination and quarantine, because um, as we've seen, there are groups and people abroad who actually still, in this um, day and age, do not fully comprehend or, or, or want to acknowledge the importance of getting vaccinated or quarantining. So well, I people often that. ask me that, actually, yeah, because they say, well, where would she have stood on it? Because, of course, she didn't, she was against the doctors. Uh, and, but it was because they medicalised it that she knew that you didn't need to medicalise it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think she would have been pretty pro vaccination. I just I think it was very very a long time that your book came out around mm -hmm. COVID when we were having these discussions again about yeah. to vaccinate or not vaccinate or to quarantine or so. Um, one final point, if I can just pick up on that um, inoculation um, question, where were you with um, information on that as it occurred in Istanbul or any sources from Istanbul at all? Well, I mean, that's why I'm very interested to talk to all of you, because I found, although I love going, I've been to Istanbul before, but I love going to try and research a bit more about Lady Mary, but I found it very, very difficult to find anything about inoculation. I tried writing to Turkish academics, I tried going to, um, to, to uh, the science museums, but I, I really couldn't get anything, which is why I had to commission an artist to come up with that little picture of the nutshells, the walnut yes, shells it's also on, the on the book, book. yes, <laughs> because I couldn't find any images from Turkey. So if anybody has any leads for me, I would be really, really interested.
I'll, I'll be curious to know when it all started as well. Like, could it be even century before that? It was. Who knows? It know? was great. It was about the 12th century. It came from China, actually, mm -hmm. oh. because the Turks were at war with the Chinese. The Chinese used to inoculate oh, up from the nose. They took, they took material from the nose up and, and put stuff up the nose, mm -hmm. yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it gradually came westwards. And it changed the style of it, shall we say. That's right. Nose using that's right. Wounds. Then we wounds and the right. that's right. The wrists and the and the ankles. Yes. It is something that um, we have acknowledged that sort of the um, Eastern cultures way back into the Middle Ages, just the advances in science and medicine. We just you know we couldn't have imagined them. No, no, and people were so brave. People. Of course, I mean another thing was that people did say with Lady Mary she was a terrible mother that she had practices on her children. But she worked out that it was safer to do that than to have yeah. them die of smallpox. So I'm not sure she actually was a bad mother, but you know, you know what these things are like. No, I mean, I think, yeah, that's, that's you know, she's absolutely a good mother for getting them inoculated. I think that's kind of a no-brainer um, in this um, day and age. You inoculate, you vaccinate your children. That's kind of parenting 101, and I suppose you have her to thank for it. It's interesting, it was the Christian women who would yes. be doing that inoculation. So they had, you could say, probably status higher than the Muslim woman, perhaps, or maybe it was... No, I think the, it was the other way, Craig. I okay. think that they thought that their lives were dispensable, mm -hmm. so it was okay. Oh, okay. Yes. okay, so yes. Like, okay, I'm thinking mm -hmm. time, like a doctor type thing, but yeah. they're yeah. more like sacrificial type of That's thing. right. I mean, in okay. fact, it was very... By the time Lady Mary arrived in Turkey, it was really pretty safe. They'd honed it very, very well. Right. Whereas actually it was back in England that things seemed to go wrong again a bit because they haven't quite worked it out. Isn't there as well um, the story of Catherine the Great of um, Russia taking the first smallpox inoculation for her country? That's right, she did. And there's a great book at the moment about that. Yes. A pioneering woman. Pioneering yes, that's right. That's Do we have any questions from Zoom or in the chat at all? Does anyone... I mean, I could talk about this, I could talk to Joe about various aspects of this all day, but... Um, there, there's some comments that people can't see, couldn't oh. see the slides too well, oh. but that's because, obviously, I'm not screen sharing the slides, I'm just doing the route. Oh, so, yeah. is it possible, perhaps later on, to get the slide, maybe a PDF, and can share it with people? Cool. Oh, yeah, right. Well, a PowerPoint, I might be able to say it as a PDF, we'll have a go. Yeah, we'll, we'll have yeah, a go. I mean, we'll, we'll, yes. Because the images nice. are good, yes. Yeah, because that, yes. I, I don't I'll want them to be really feel that yes. left out, shall we say. Absolutely, no, of course we can do that. But yeah, yes. if, the, if you have any questions, um, Zoom friends, um, post them now, please, because we are coming towards the end of the presentation. I was just thinking, actually, a tiny little aside. You know, you were talking about the, the wrists and the ankles. Well, Mary's kind of hopeless son, Edward, not hopeless, but sad son, really, when he ran away to sea, um, he kept saying, oh, I'm the, the child of Lady Mary Wetley Montague. And they, they kept saying, ridiculous, they called him the Duke. And, <laughs> and of course, he didn't have photographs to identify people. Yeah. But he, because he had the wounds, he was able to show them that actually he was. And that's how they managed to get him out of Gibraltar. And he's been Better than a birthmark. Yes, exactly. <laughs> a birthmark. Remarkable. Now, we will certainly try and get that, those slides shared. Thank you. Thank yes, you. and yeah. again, please contact Joe or uh, Joe through Craig if anyone is interested in acquiring the book. I've got my copy. Yes. Very excited to read it. Yes. Happy um, to send it to you. Yes. So yes, please reach out. Thank you everyone for joining us. People are here and people who are on Zoom. Yes. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you very much for having me. And you. yeah, much <laughs> food for thought. Some great discussions being had. So uh, Spread the word about Lady Mary. Spread the word, yes. yes. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the first feminist maybe. The first scientist. Yes. The scientist. Certainly, certainly an early feminist. Indeed. That's right. Yes. 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 Hmm. I would read a book on the Georgian feminist. <laughs> just, just saying, but you're an academic. Well, no, I mean, uh, yes, uh, uh, the 18th century is my field, but also I, I, I feel I love the Victorian era. It's very rich, but there is so much about it. Like the number of books that have Victorian whatever in the title, it would just be a little something different, I think. But that's just me. I say, hmm, right. Yes. Hmm. Anyway, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, if that's it, I will bid you good night, and we can thank our speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everybody.